questions. We have with us Professor Ebu Mensa, former president of this university. We have with us Professor Kaku Sagari Moko, who is also the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Business Administration. We have here Professor Pitankuma Ponsa, who is the Dean of the Graduate School. Um, we also have in our midst the affiliation coordinator for the University of Cape Coast, Mr. Justice Martin. Justice. <laughs> also, let me acknowledge the presence of Pastor Professor E.B. Amponsa, Rector, Bellevue University, Techiman Campus. I know there are many other professors around. Yes. There are many other professors around, uh, but we will acknowledge your presence as we go by. And the chairman for the function is Professor Daniel Obino of Uri, the president of Cali University College of Ghana. On this note, I want to go to the next item, which is introduction of the inaugural lecture. Prof. And it should be done by Professor Daniel Obino for the presidency of CD. Bishops, professors, distinguished invited guests, our cherished students, staff, I'm very delighted and humbled and also privileged to introduce Professor in the Potu. So today we are happy that one of us and become a professor and is going to adore himself. Reverend Monsignor Professor Stephen T is a professor of educational psychology. He holds the PhD in psychology of education, school of pedagogy from the Salesian Pontifical University of Rome, who obtained it in 1999. Master of Philosophy in Educational Psychology and Bachelor of Education from the same university in 1997 and 1995, respectively. Additionally, he holds a combined Master's of Arts degree in the study of religious and religious education from the Graduate School of Religion and Religious Education, Fordham University, New York, 1988. Postgraduate Diploma in Adult Religious Education Bandham, Ireland, in 1986. Diploma in Theology from the University of Ghana, 1983. Mr. Roman Catholic was ordained on 15 July 1984 at the Cathedral Basilica of St. Peter the Apostle in Kumasi. Reverend Monsignor Professor Stephen Tim has been a priest for 37 years and has served in various high-ranking positions in the church. The greater part of his life as priest has been in the area of education, teaching, and diocesan administration. He has had the privilege of serving in various educational committees, especially in the Catholic hierarchy, nationally and internationally. From 1990 to 1994, 
He served on the then Religious Education Committee of the Association of Episcopal Conferences of Anglophone West Africa for English-speaking bishops of Ghana, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, and Liberia. From the same period, he was also the vice chairman of the National Catechetical Commission of the Ghana Catholic Bishops Conference. Reverend Monsignor Professor Stephen Tim was the founding dean of the Faculty of Education of the Catholic University College of Ghana and served as a dean for 13 years, from June 2007 through to July 2020. <laughs> Reverend Monsignor Professor Tim has also served the university community in various areas as a member of the University Council of the Catholic University College, March 2007 to 2021. Member of the Senate, Chairman of the University's Admissions Board, Chairman of the University's Strategic Planning Committee, Chairman of the Disciplinary Committee, Chairman of the Library Board, Member of the University's Appointments and Promotion Board, and many others. Currently, he is the Dean of International Programs and Institutional Advancement. Reverend Monsignor Professor Stephen Ting is a distinguished academic, a prolific writer, and a researcher who has published extensively in high ranking international academic journals and contributed significantly to the knowledge, especially in the area of education and psychology. He is a member of the International Association of Cognitive Psychologists and a member of the Ghana Psychology Council. He is also a translator. Monsignor Professor Intim speaks and writes in French, Italian, German, and Latin. Besides Inus and Akan. In April 2008, based on his contribution to the church, he was honored by Pope Benedict XVI as a prelate of honor and with the title of Monsignor, which comes from the from the French word Monsignor, my Lord. He received his investiture as a Monsignor on 1st November 2008 in the St. Peter's Cathedral Basilica in Kumasi. His hobbies are reading, writing, teaching, working with young people. My Lord Bishops, Ladies and gentlemen, I have an honor to invite Reverend Monsignor Professor Stephen Tim to deliver his inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Chairman of Council and the Episcopal Power Chairman of the Catholic University College of Ghana, Fiapri, Most Reverend Matthew Jemfi, 
My Lord Archbishops and Bishops here present, Professor Daniel Obino Furi, Vice Chancellor of this University College, distinguished invited professors from other universities, my dear brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen. It is with that I stand here before you today to give this inaugural address. You'll recall that this address can be traced back to early universities in Europe in the 15th century and 14th century medieval universities. And newly installed professors were, were and are required to give a professorial inaugural lecture. And this is comparable to the Christian tradition among the Judaism. In Judaism, for example, at the age of 13, every Jewish boy who reaches the age of 13 will be called upon to stand before the crowd and read the Torah in the original Hebrew. And what was required of the boy was articulation and professional faith. In a similar way, I am also standing here before you today. And just like the Jewish boy, the boy always pronounced and say that I am Bar Mitzvah. I'm a son of the law. In a similar way, I am also standing before you here today. And just like the Jewish boy, I'm declaring proudly today that I am a professor. <laughs> and a full professor of educational psychology. Having given this, I would like to explain why I have chosen the topic. A few decades ago, copious research emerged in educational psychology that has focused on the working memory. So people found to have problems in basic literacy skills, such as reading, analogical reasoning, and etc., were required to be seen as having challenges of the working memory. So the working memory is typically seen to be a strong predictor for literacy skills. Therefore, reading and mathematics difficulties exhibited by learners in many instances are seen as memory challenges. And therefore, the working memory is considered to be a good foundation for pedagogical intervention, if you want to improve learners' performance in the classroom. Having explained this topic, I would like to address this inaugural lecture along the following four thematic areas. The first part of the lecture, I will look at the social cost of illiteracy, which initially spread my intellectual curiosity to investigate the underlying psychological processes to learners' difficulties in literacy skills. That will form the first part of this lecture. Having given this as background, and in the second lecture, I will present 
the psychological framework, the psychological theory, as it were, that has informed most of my research conducted. That is the psychological theory of the human memory. I will present that in the second section of the lecture. Then the third section of the lecture, I will show some research conducted and my findings. And then finally, I will draw the pedagogical implications of these findings for classroom intervention. Bishop Chairman, every academic has an underlying reason for engaging in a specific research area. My intellectual curiosity has been to find some, to find some answers to questions such as how come in this age and time, globally, one out of every five people are completely illiterate? How come? That about three billion people, globally, are still struggling to read and write at the basic level. So these were the things that influenced why I've chosen this topic. For example, causes of functional illiteracy, even among some people who have been exposed to some level of schooling. The inability to read medical prescriptions. Inability to read whether or not the drug bought from a pharmacy shop has expired. So functional literacy such as poor language and reading skills, deficient orthography skills, and lack of competent numeracy skills are typical in many of our rural schools in Africa and Ghana. In sub-Saharan Africa, poor reading among school children in rural basic schools continue to show poor learning achievement per the Assessment of Learning Achievement Report. Indeed, as a country, we have made significant improvement in terms of educational access, especially to the most indigent. For example, gross and rating rates at both kindergarten and primary levels have gone up higher. Gender parity at all levels of pre tertiary education has gone up. And indeed, the most prioritized sector in Ghana is the education sector. And Ghana has exceeded even the global benchmarks, if you read the World Bank report. The above notwithstanding, there are still significant challenges in terms of student learning outcomes at both the basic level and secondary levels of education. We face challenges. For example, the National Education Assessment 2016 confirmed that in Ghana, 30% and 50% of primary four peoples were found to have below the minimum proficiency for English and mathematics. At primary six, figures were found to be approximately 30% for both subjects. In 2013 and 2015, early grade, that is primary reading grade assessment, did not change in Ghana. And the statistics were that only 22% of primary two people were able to read with some appropriate level. With 50% unable to identify a single word.
in the senior high schools. Learning outcomes were only found to be as low as 33% of students passing the WASI for mathematics in 2017 and 2016 with less than a quarter of students qualifying to enter into tertiary education. It is to respond to these key challenges that over the last three or so decades I have attempted as a student of psychology to explore and research into the mind as a working memory. Specifically, how the mind as working memory implicates cognitive processes of language and numeracy. So specifically, many of my work with theoretical and empirical insights from education psychology have examined how the mind works with respect to text reading, language comprehension, analogical reasoning, and it's within this context that I present a summary of the framework the key concepts that have informed my research over the years. And that's how the working memory is supposed to do in our minds. You see the three segments there. The first compartment, the sensory memory, where incoming stimulus, incoming external stimulus, the first enter there in the sensory memory and that has a very limited capacity. It can contain only three to seven units of information. And if nothing happens, the information is forgotten. In terms of duration, only 0 0.5 to 3 seconds and the formation is gone, if nothing is done. Then, from the sensory memory, two processes there, attention and the perception, I'll take my time to explain. From there, it enters into the working memory, which is the workbench memory. And there, in terms of the capacity, it can contain only seven to nine chunks of information, and in terms of duration, only 5 to 15 seconds. And if you don't rehearse, the information is forgotten. Then from there, the information enters into the long-term memory, which is like an encyclopedia, an archive. Information enters there, and every information that enters into the working memory, that information is there forever. Then the question is, why do we forget? We forget not because the information is not there. We forget because the cues helping us to retrieve the information is what we are lacking. It's just like going to the library to look for a book. The book is there. But the information leading you to the shelf where the book is, is what you're not finding. So as soon as information gets there, it is there forever. Now, this framework It's called information processing theory. And it is based on the idea that human beings, all of us, actively process the information we receive from our senses, just like a computer. So learning is what happens when our brains receive the information. Then the brains record the information. They mold the information and store the information. So the basic architecture of our human cognition according to the informational process approach is that our information works like this. Now, the first section that was called the sensory memory, let me take my time to explain a bit of that because it's very important 
to what I'm going to discuss here. Text reading. These two processes take place. Perception and attention. Perception of one who receives information from the environment and then our senses, especially the sensory memory, begin to work on some of them, not all. So some selection takes place here. It's not every information that we hear or sense that we pay attention to. Some selection takes place. And the selection is determined by many variables. The first variable has to do with your mental state. So for example, if you are sitting in your office on the 10th floor, you hear the sound of the siren of the fire service passing by. You hear the sound. You perceive the sound. But you don't pay attention. You don't pay attention to that. Two days later, you are driving on a highway. You hear the siren of the fire service this time. As you are driving on the highway and you hear the siren, this time you pay attention. Why? Your mental state has changed. Now you are on the highway, you are driving. If you don't pay attention, you can get into a problem. That is how perception depends on our mental state. So the mental state that forces us to make some selection in what we pay attention to. The same fellow, three days later, he's standing in front of a house that has caught fire. The house is burning. This time around, you pay even more attention because the mental state has changed. And this is what happens to all of us when we are engaged in any mental activity, especially when we are reading. So, how we perceive things, how we perceive events, at this level, implicates how we present the problem. So perception of stimuli involves mental representation, mental interpretation. And the mental interpretation depends on your mental state and how you have perceived the problem. Let me give an example here. Supposing the primary one people is asked to solve the problem, 26 minus 9, and give the answer as 23 which is wrong. 23 minus 9, instead of 17, he says the answer is 23. What is going on in the mind of the child? The child has perceived the problem, but he has perceived it to be the same as solving subtraction of units. So borrowing is not part of his perception. Therefore, he's not pay, paying attention to that. And the smart teacher will be able to know that the prerequisite that this child is having is that he's lacking a prerequisite skill of borrowing because the mind is not there. He's not paying attention to that. That's what perception do to all of us. Now, perception controls attention. So attention is always directed by perception. What we selectively pay attention to is conditioned by our perception. And there are three types of attention that all of us have. Involuntary attention, where we don't want to pay attention, but we are forced to pay attention. For example, as I'm giving this lecture, all of a sudden, we will hear a gunshot all of you will involuntarily turn and see what is happening. That is a fact. That is involuntary attention. At times we have that. 
Then we have voluntary attention or volusional or selective attention where we selectively ignore everything and pay attention. And then the hab habitual attention. We are all habituated by habit, by training, to pay attention to certain things and ignore others. For example, a mother will always pay attention to the crying of a child and probably ignore all other children. That is habitual attention. Now, in reading a text, a location of attention, selective attention, is very critical. And there's a reason for that. Psychological reason, of course. This is because important text information is better learned than less important information. Because our cognitive architecture is designed in such a way that all of us cannot hold all information in a text simultaneously. It's not possible. And I'll come to that. How our mental, especially the working memory, is so limited. So, when you are reading a text, we devote more attention to important information and ignore less important attention. That is why attention is important. The third reason, precisely because of this element of selection and importance, psychologically, we devote extra attention in proportion to what we consider important in any text that is before us. And the fourth reason, because of this extra attention, important text elements are learned better. It's within this context that these two processes, perception and attention, is very important at the sensory level. The second compartment that I showed there was the working memory. Information that we pay attention to, that we have selectively paid attention to, is then transferred to the second component. That is the working memory. And there, as I said, is it limited compared to the computer. Now, if you think that the short-term memory, as I'm explaining, is not the case, let me give you an example so that you know that it's not just a theory. Supposing you do have your phone with you, cell phone, and I ask you to go about 15 meters away to ring a number 0244233065. From here to the telephone booth, telephone booth, as you go, if you don't rehearse the number 0244233065, by the time you reach there, you have forgotten. It's a fact. It's a fact. So, that tells us that whereas computer artificial intelligence can contain limitless number of information, the human working memory is not. Our working memory can hold information only 20 seconds. Only 20 seconds. If the information is not rehearsed over and over. So, comes the question. Given this limited nature of our working memory, the question is this. How does the limited working memory that we all have compensate to reduce mental load when we are involved in A, storing so many information in the textbook? Simultaneously, processing stored information while at the same time you are reading to make inferences of what is not explicitly stated in the text. This is what happens to our minds when you are reading. So how does the mind reduce this load? This is how it works. 
to compensate for this limited nature, your mind and my mind stores information in a network of propositions. What do you mean by a network of propositions? Ideas that are related rather than ideas that are not related automatically activates another related idea. And we call this spread of activation or priming. Let me give you an example, if you think it's also a theory. If you have a bread on your, on your table, as soon as you see bread, you immediately think of butter or margarine. If you see a table knife, what comes to your mind is what? Fork. Your friend has a cold. So what comes to your mind is that possibly he lacks ascorbic acid, lacks vitamin C. So the moment vitamin C comes into your mental, your mind will automatically activate the idea for the needs of fruits. So one idea that is, that is related activate another related idea so that it becomes like a parallel unlike computer that stores information serially one by one our human memory stores information in parallel in networks one idea that is related stimulates another idea in order to limit the mental load because if it exceeds about seven chunks of information if it exceeds about 20 seconds, then the mind gets choked. So one idea will automatically activate another idea. And when you're reading text, this is what goes on in your mind, even though we don't know. So, the idea behind the concept mental load reduction is that as we are engaged in storing and processing information, the mind selectively attend to related and relevant information either in the text or composing the text or in mathematical reasoning. That's how the mind does. And it's this load reduction and selective attention that helps all of us, unlike the computer, to be able to make inferences. Let me give an example to substantiate. Supposing you read a sentence. The robbers robbed the bank. The robbers robbed the bank. And then you underline the word bank. Every person who reads this statement will know that the bank here is not the bank of a river, but the bank of where we deposit money. Why? Because of the subject robbers and the verb robbed. That is what comes to our mind when we are reading. And that helps us to make inferences. Artificial intelligence computer cannot do that. On the other hand, in the case of computer, it can store so many information and still the memory will not get choked. But in our human mind, when we don't relate related ideas, try to make inferences, try to find resume, paraphrasing, if we don't do that and we want to go one by one, the mind gets choked. And that is the problem we have in this country. And I'll come to that. Most of our children in the basic schools lack what they call perceptual processes at this central level. Okay. So the cognitive processes in reading looks like this. At the sensory level, these processes take place there. We call them perceptual processes. And three mental processes are involved. Eye fixation, letter identification, and phenom. This takes place when all of us are involved in reading. Because it is at the sensory level, 
It's supposed to be automatic. But we have a problem in this country, in the Blau Basic Schools, where most of our children spend more time here on the perceptual processes, what we call matching, eye fixation, to use the eye to see letters, then combine letters into words, then use the words to sound out what the English we call, call phenom. We call it recording. It's supposed to be automatic. Less than 0 0.5 seconds. But if most of our students spend even here more time trying to identify letters, trying to sound out the letters in order to make meaning, they are not able to do that. Which means that the next level, at the working memory level, where we have to do all these various mental processes as we engage in reading, passing, where we segment sentences together to reduce the load. If you even at this first level, they have problem there, it comes here then becomes another problem. Test integration. Where you read a text, and then you integrate sentence level, paragraph level, and so forth and so on. Combining them to get the coherent meaning of what you are reading. If even here they have problem, this also becomes a problem. So here, all these four things, passing, text integration, summarization, text elaboration, a typical student have problems it becomes very difficult for such a person to move to be able to integrate what will happen in the next level. That is what we call the episodic memory. Many things that has already stored in the memory, to be able to re retrieve that, to bring that to bear in what is written, it becomes a challenge. So all these perceptual processes eye fixation, letter identification, etc. It's the beginning of our reading. And it's supposed to be fast, it's supposed to be automatic, so you don't have to waste the mental load. But most students still have problems with that, and therefore when it comes to higher mental processing, it becomes very difficult. So in reading, that Differences between skilled readers and non-skilled readers are essentially that of speed. Speed. Especially at the sensory level of eye fixation, letter identification, sounding out words. Then comes the question, why is speed is important? Speed is important because if it takes a long time for a child to identify letters, put the letters into words, sound them out, generate meaning. Then the child would have forgotten what he had said, read previously. That is how the mind works. Now, when it happens like this, it creates more difficulties in generating meaning. And one of the essential differences between skilled and non-skilled readers has to do with this idea of speed. So whereas non-skilled readers spend time on these perceptual, otherwise automatic processes, skilled readers are quick to mentally do this, process them, by so they reduce the mental load and move on to higher cognitive processes in the second and third level. Now, four mental processes that I have investigated over the years, and they are all there. Decoding, letter comprehension, inferential comprehension, and comprehension monitoring. Each of the four mental processes here have impact on reading processes, and I'll explain each of them how they implicate reading. Let's take the first one. 
The decoding, two mental processes are involved here. Matching and recoding. So matching is what I've already explained, letter identification. Recoding, sounding out in order to create meaning in the long-term memory. If a child string words together but cannot sound them out, meaning cannot take place. It's not possible. It's not possible. The child can only activate meaning when he strings the words out and pronounce them out. So these are quick processes many of our students here in Ghana, especially in our public basic schools, this is where the problem is. Literal comprehension is the next level. Two things are here, very important, psychologically important. Lexical access and passing. During lexical access, meanings of words are identified in the short-term memory. Certain words that even the child, if he's a good reader, has not, even, has not even met the word, can go back to his episodic memory, bring the word out, match what he's reading, and then make meaning out of that. So during lexical access, the meanings of words are identified. Again, for some of us children, the problem is here. And this part belongs to the third part, the long-term memory, where they have to go back, select from the various vocabularies that they have learned, bring the vocabularies to what they are reading, and within the context, be able to find out the meaning of that word. You see, mentally, it's a long process. And the load becomes difficult at this level. So, if the previous level, the previous level ones has not been consolidated, as they go higher, it becomes more difficult for them. Then we have person, as we know, segmenting of sentences into units of meaning. And when we segment sentences for us in psychology, the meaning of that is that it helps to reduce the load. That is the purpose of passing, segmenting sentences into meaning. And it's normally processed at the working memory, again. And by doing so, readers process incoming data, economically as memory, and process, and the processing control is limited. So I have a sentence there. Kwesi called Kwabna. Kwabna called Kwesi. The two sentences obviously are not the same. Based on how they are structured. But they both have the same grammatical rules of subject, verb, and object. Now, in one of my research, one of the basic schools, I'll mention the name of the place. When you ask the children, can you tell me the distinction between Kwasi Kwa Kwa Blan Kwa Blan Kwa Kwasi? They will tell you they are the same. So the process, the underlying problem has to do Apart from the first one that I talked about, the perceptual process, this first person, segmenting sentences into units, is one of the challenges of most of our primary school children in this country. Okay. The third level, inferential comprehension. What do you mean by that? after you have been able to access me to have literal comprehension, the next is to find out whether or not the children have ability to infer, go beyond the text, summarize, elaborate the ideas, and there are three processes, mental processes also involved here. The first process is what's called integration. 
The second process is called summarization, and the third is what called elaboration. So integration is a coherent way of mentally representing ideas in a text that are not explicitly stated, but could be inferred. Let me give an example that I did in one of my experiments. Primary three. And they were asked to read the following sentence. It's not on the board there. I'm only explaining. They were asked to read the following sentences. The lion walked towards James. Sentence one. The lion walked towards James. He ran. Sentence two. Then I asked this primary three kids. The he there refers to who? Majority said they refer to the lion. Now, what, what is my point? Of course, if you say that the lion walked towards James, he ran. I mean, logically, the he there does not necessarily mean that it could refer to James. It could be any other person who ran. It could be another person who has nothing to do with James and he's running for the sake of running. But, inference tells us when you are reading the text, when it's not explicitly stated, then by means of integration, it should tell you that the he there refers to James and not the lion. Integration is one of the challenges our children in our public Public, I'm not talking of the private. That's what they are facing. Okay? Now, why is this, why am I explaining this? I'm not even worried so much about the grammar. I'm more worried about the, the psychology here. When the lion walked towards James, and he ran, for us in psychology, we assume that in our mental lexicon, in our mental memory, because of the images that we all have about lions, that they are ferocious, they can kill you, they can destroy you, then by means of this, you can infer psychologically that the he who ran was the person that the, the lion was walking towards to. It's as simple as that. And these things happen in the long-term memory where every child is supposed to retrieve from his memory some of these things that we have been brought up or have been schooled. Everybody knows that lions are ferocious. And therefore, when the lion walked towards James and James is a he and he ran, why can't you imply that and say that he refers to James? You said that he refers to the lion. So, that is integration. So, it's a coherent way of mentally representing ideas in a text, not explicitly stated, but could be inferred. And our children have a lot of problems with that. So, after integration, the next thing that also happens in our minds, all these things that I'm talking, happens in our minds. It's what they call summarization. The text is before you, okay? And the function of summarization is to produce a kind of a memory microstructure in the mind of the reader as you read. And through this, our minds can be killed to pay attention because of certain phrases 
that come to us as we read. For example, in summary, in conclusion, in general, we call them keys. They are like keys that should open our mind to know that the next statement following is a conclusion. It's a very important point. Again, most of our case has problem with this. When we are reading a text, the skilled ones, as they pay attention to such phrases as in summary, in conclusion, in general, so that they can follow the summary statement that follows, those who are not skilled readers, they don't pay attention to this at all. And over and over and over, in my experiment, I found that mostly in our basic rural schools, in the rural areas, compared to the urban areas. So, the moment that you see in summary, in conclusion, what happens in your minds and my mind is that the reader is likely to create a microstructure realizing that a very important statement is following. So again, when skilled readers, unlike skilled readers, use these activated interconnections in their working memory to generate microstructure for paragraphs, the others are not. They lack that. They lack that. The next one, elaboration. So where are the other two that I've explained above? Integration and elaboration and summarization. As I explained, organize information by building coherent meanings. Elaboration, on the other hand, as to the meaning by making inferences through prior knowledge that the reader has about what is being read. The next point, comprehension monitoring. This is that cognitive process where readers begin to ask themselves, do I understand what I'm reading? Can I summarize it? Can I paraphrase it? If I'm asked to give to summarize in a different way, can I do that? All this is what about comprehension monitoring. And again, fast readers are better at these things. All skilled readers give you the repetition. They are not able to paraphrase. They are not able to summarize. They have a problem with that. A special comprehension monitoring, in other words, Monitoring their own comprehension, they lack that. So these four cognitive processes, decoding, literal comprehension, inferential comprehension, and comprehension monitoring, that I investigated, they have one consistent finding, and that is what is up there. Children, with specific deficit in reading accuracy in any of the above four mental processes. Decoding, literal comprehension, inferential comprehension, comprehension monitoring, have reading problems. And more than 85% of the cases, they present a deficit, moderate deficit in language and reading comprehension. So, Bishop Chairman, it is within this context that I present a few of my empirical work that I have investigated in this third part of the lecture. So, I'm going to showcase a few of my findings. The first category of research that I conducted that has to do with working memory investigated 
working memory and children difficulty in reading analogical reasoning. And under this, I'll present just three publications and findings. The second one, the second group, say within the context of working memory, how familiarity of text also help what you call schema automation, right? It makes things become automatic. You read fast. I've investigated all that. Okay? I'll present just a few. That research on psychosocial dimensions of education, family background, and children's and literacy skill. Let me present the first, just one of the first one. The title is there. Comprehension skill differences between proficient and less proficient readers in word to text integration. Implications for intervention for students with reading problems. That was published in the International Journal of Learning. They are all there. And it's also on Google. If you go and you just Google my name and the title, everything is there. You can read it for yourself. The objectives was to investigate how text integration as higher cognitive process produces cognitive structures that are the end desired result of reading. The second objective, to find out what constitutes the core mental differences between proficient and less proficient readers of expository text. So it was, of course, experimental research. These were the measures. We did first pretest, was administered to show that there isn't divergent performance between the two. Then experiment two and three tested the third and research questions. Good. We use this reading mastery as one of the psychological tools to assess this. What were the findings? One, proficient readers were found to be more than two times faster at lower order process than less proficient readers. And supporting the hypothesis that word decoding, accurate and fast retrieval of lower order processes for knowledge is critical in reading comprehension. The second finding, the faster that these lower processes are processed, the quicker the readers pay attention to other higher processes. And therefore, being able to make meaning in test comprehension. The third finding where the test comprehension was found, not found to be dependent on word identification. What I mean is that those perceptual things that are supposed to be fast have nothing at all to do with comprehension. It's rather the, main, the higher processes, like ability to infer meaning, ability to paraphrase, ability to integrate meanings. These were things that will help, not the lower processes. Another finding, skill readers or skill reading was found to be more complex. It involved two mental processes, coordination and integration of higher cognitive processes than word identification. So if many of our students, our young ones, are still there, then there's a problem. Proficient readers, unlike less proficient readers, were more able to combine various cognitive and metacognitive processes, such as inferential comprehension. So that is that group. Then I also went in to find out to what extent that a text familiarity, a text that you know something about, if you have to read that, and because you have some knowledge, some previous knowledge, it's presumed that some of these things that I've talked about will be automatic. And therefore, it will help to reduce the working memory loads in order to enhance reading. So that one was also conducted. 
It was to find out if contextual knowledge of text discourse will reduce constraints in the working memory. These were some of the measures. They were asked to recall questions, make inference, to be able to recognize patterns, ability to make summaries. What were the findings? In all the four measures that I conducted, results suggested appreciable differences in performance between the experimental group and the control group. So the consistent, consistent better performance of the experimental groups in all measures was interpreted as plausible influence of previous knowledge of analogous text that helped them to make the schema automation and therefore they were able to comp comprehend. So readers who are privy to information use text schemata to manage and process text in parallel as one element. Conclusion for this particular finding, not conclusion of the talk, for this particular finding. <laughs> Test comprehension appears to be critically connected to previous knowledge. It is previous knowledge that predicts schema instantiation and automation. Three, this process of schema automation reduces processing load. And when the load is reduced, it precipitates selective attention and therefore it enhances comprehension. These were the findings and conclusions of that particular research. What implication has this for teachers? So at the basic level, challenges that you have with our students, with our peoples, have intrinsic psychological antecedents. And therefore, effective teaching and learning must be designed to control mental load, especially for second language users, those who, all of us who are using second language. Third, teaching and learn of reading comprehension become effective when they are taught within the context of what is already familiar known to the peoples. Then another group of my research, again, working memory and analogical mathematical reasoning in children. Again, my interest in the phenomenon of poor literacy acquisition, the working memory, let me to investigate what is it that makes children give imprecise answers. For example, it is not there, I'm only explaining. If a child in the house sees that mommy and daddy calls the cat, cat, and he sees that the cat has the same features as the dog, the cat has four legs, the cat has a tail, the cat has a fair, the mommy and daddy calls it cat. Then they bring a dog to the house, the dog has the same features, four legs, a tail, a fair. There is 95 probability the child will call the cat or the dog a cat. Just watch out. So, I became interested to find out what is it that is causing these imprecise answers. So I entered into this. Binary and ternary analogy, where I gave the children certain analogies. Binary analogy means two analogies. Ternary analogy means three analogies. And you realize that for the second analogies where the kids, the very young ones, three to four, 5 to 11, they had no problem with that. But as we move toward the ternary analogies, the load becomes higher, then they start falling. So compared to binary analogy, when it comes to ternary, they have a problem with that. So, when I considered this, the results indicated 
For the much younger children, they were capable of attending to and making relations. However, they were less likely to overcome misleading objects of a similarity. In other words, when we are moving from binary analogy to ternary, it becomes a problem for them. So cognitive load, again, needs to be controlled at this level so that meaningful learning can occur in interactions of all elements. Another group of research that is psycholinguistics. Psycholinguistics. And again, let me explain. For us, our interest in psycholinguistics is not language as such, like those in language or linguistics. Our interest, as psychologists find out, for example, how does language develop? And you realize that about three to six months, six to eight months, when children are very happy, the mother has breastfed them, suck the breast, and they are lying down. Then they start to bubble. We call it bubbling. Bubbling. And they always begin with a consonant. Mm, mm. They equal to themselves. That's how language begins. We call it babbling or ecolalia. They want to hear themselves out. That's how language begins. So for us in psychology, this is why I'm interested. Another reason why we're interested in that is that apart from finding out how language begins, how is it that in our native maternal language, none of our parents sat us down to teach us present tense, past tense, future tense. Is that not the case? But it comes automatically. That is where our interest is in psychology. How is it that a child is never taught the tenses, and yet the child can know and grow without being taught like if you're using a can, the child can hear their mother saying, tomorrow I will go. And no, I'm a call. Yesterday I went. The child automatically gets that. How does that develop? I know those of you who are not interested in psychology, they, they don't sound like Greek. Okay? But that is how our minds work. So, my interest in this as I call it, led me to investigate the perception here in Ghana that when children are taught from the homes with English, when they go to school, they will perform better than those who are taught with the native language. Is that not the case? That's the perception. And I wanted to test this empirically. And I did. I selected few students from higher backgrounds who were taught in the homes, very good at English, but they were not good in the home in the maternal, maternal language. Then those who were taught only with the native language, not all good in English. The third group, those who are taught both English and Akan. And you'd be surprised at the findings. Initially, because these kids have been taught with English in the home, when it comes to interpersonal communication, they are excellent. 